This is the Mahabharata Podcast, Episode 7, The Heroes and the Villains Are Born. Last time, we left off with the birth and childhood of the three Kuru princes, Dhritarashtra, Pandu, and Vidur. Due to the untimely death of their father, and their uncle Bhishma's unwillingness to father children, their uncle Vyasa stepped in and engendered these three boys. This might normally sound like an act of incest, but Satyavati and Bhishma felt it was okay considering the alternatives, and they cited precedents among their ancestors in which Brahmins made love to Kshatriya wives in order to save the race of Kshatriyas. The boys were not without defects, however. Dhritarashtra was born blind, Pandu was an albino, or at least pale, and Vidur was born of a slave and therefore in a way illegitimate. As the boys came of age, the second brother, Pandu, was crowned king, and Bhishma set about finding wives for his nephews. Starting with the eldest son, Dhritarashtra, Bhishma contracted a marriage with the princess from the kingdom of Gandhara. This was a state to the far northwest of India, in modern-day Pakistan. If you were to look at a map of India at the time of the Mahabharata, you would see that the land of the Kurus, from Hastinapur on the Ganges to Indraprastha on the Yamuna, is pretty much right in the middle of the line of kingdoms stretching from the northwest to southeast along the Himalayan foothills. With the central location and exceptionally fertile lands, the Kurus must have been strategically important players in the international politics of the day. I've put a link to a good map on my website under this episode, so please check it out. The geopolitical aspects of these alliances are not completely clear, but there are clues that more is going on than just egotistical princes fighting over points of honor or greed. This princess from Gandhara was named Gandhari. Her family at first hesitated to marry her to a blind man, but reconsidered because he was the eldest son in a powerful dynasty. It appears to me from this and a few other examples that at the time children were married off in order of age, so the only available son was really Dhritarashtra. Gandhari was the epitome of a good wife. Loyal to the degree that once she was engaged, she refused to even mention other men by name. She even went to the extreme of tying a cloth over her eyes and blinding herself so she would not have any advantage over her husband. Gandhari was a particularly attractive match because after propitiating Rudra Shiva, she had been granted the boon of having 100 sons. With her, the Kuru dynasty need never fear a shortage of heirs to the throne. Quite the contrary. Gandhari was delivered to her new husband in the company of her brother, the crown prince of Gandhara, named Shakuni. Shakuni must have enjoyed his welcome, because he was to return many times in the future and cause a lot of trouble. One last point of interest in this marriage was that Shakuni also delivered a large fortune. The Gandharans paid for the honor of an alliance with the Kurus. With Dhritarashtra thus married off, Pandu came next for finding a wife. Pandu must have been more presentable because he attended the Swayamvara held for Kunti of the Yadus, where she would choose her own husband from the crowd of applicants. Kunti was the daughter of Shura, who was the chief or king of the Yadus. She was then adopted by another king named Kunti Boja. The Yadus ruled over the region around Mathura to the south of the Kurus. Kunti Boja was a southern neighbor to the Yadus. Thus, the tie with Kunti solidified an alliance with the two kingdoms to the south. Another important thing about Kunti's descent is that her brother, named Vasudeva, will be Krishna's father. So Pandu not only had an alliance with a southern neighbor, he also happened to become the future uncle-in-law of the lord of everything. Following this marriage with Kunti, Pandu traveled with Bhishma to another kingdom just west of Hastinapur called Madra. There, they contracted another marriage with the daughter of that king. Her name was Madri. In this case, it was the Kurus who paid out a fortune to arrange for the marriage. Pandu followed up his two marriages with a great campaign against his other neighbors. Having solidified links with kingdoms to the west and south, he followed the Ganges downstream through Kashi, Magadha, Pundra, Videha, and Suma, through modern-day Bihar and West Bengal, defeating them all in battle and subjugating them to the Kuru throne. Having studied Indian history from the early sultanates through the British Raj, I find it interesting how little the politics of India has changed. From ancient times up to independence, the imperial power always seemed to prefer to rule by proxy rather than direct rule. When a kingdom was subjugated, the conquering power preferred to leave the regional prince on their throne and were content to receive tribute and military support in exchange. Thus, 
Even though Pandu and his allies conquered all this region, from the Fork and the Ganges Yamuna rivers to the sea, they did not depose the kings of these states. Rather, they demanded large tributes and alliances, and then returned home in glory. Following his massive imperial conquest, Pandu settled down to a life of hunting. He left internal state affairs in the hands of his capable uncle and brothers, and lived with his two wives in constant travel, hunting from forest to forest. Considering that in ancient times, hunting and warfare were almost indistinguishable, there may have been a political aspect to Pandu's travels. I imagine that constantly moving around his conquered territories with a large armed retinue was an effective way of maintaining his hold over these kingdoms. While Pandu was off on his expeditions, his younger brother, Vidur, was eventually married to the illegitimate daughter of a king named Devaka. With her, Vidur had many sons of perfect demeanor who matched him in his virtues. No one is quite sure how these things came about, but just as there are two different stories about Bhishma's incarnation from the Vasus, there are two versions of how Dhritarashtra's wife, Gandhari, got the boon to have 100 sons. I already described the first version, where she propitiated Shiva. The second version is given when we are told of her pregnancy. In this version, she had once comforted Vyasa when he had arrived exhausted with hunger and fatigue. Vyasa then allowed her to make one wish. She asked that she be granted 100 sons. Sometime later, she became pregnant. Nine months passed, and she was still pregnant. In fact, she remained pregnant for two full years. It seemed like she might never give birth. In the meantime, she heard about Pandu's wives having one son after another, all while she was still pregnant. So let's cut away from Gandhari and see what happened to Pandu that his wives suddenly produced so many sons. This story begins with Pandu out hunting. While on the chase, he came across a buck while it was mounting a doe. He fired five arrows at them in succession and killed them in the act of mating. As they died, he discovered the buck was actually a man. It turned out that a powerful ascetic had disguised himself as a deer and he was out frolicking in the forest when Pandu shot him and his deer partner. As he died, the sadhu cursed Pandu. The ascetic asked him, how could you do this murder? Pandu replied that hunting was the way of kings. There was absolutely nothing wrong with him killing a deer. The Brahmin replied that the sin was not in killing him, but that Pandu did it while they were in the act of lovemaking. For that, he cursed Pandu, saying that the next time he should try to make love to his wife, he would die. I find this bit of bestiality interesting. First, in a prior version of this story, given in a summary at the beginning of Book 7, they don't say that the ascetic was in the form of a deer. They just say he was jumping a doe in his human form. Even in this later version, the ascetic describes himself as wearing the guise of a deer and saying that he consorted with does out of his extreme shyness with women. Be that as it may, Pandu, who did not yet have a single child, was now unable to make love to his wives without killing himself in the act. Pandu was extremely sorry for having killed this Brahmin. He thought of his father, Vichy Travirya, and how he had died childless after following a life in pursuit of pleasure. He decided to follow the path of his natural father, Vyasa, and to forsake his worldly possessions and become a hermit in the forest. The book is not clear on when exactly Pandu gave up the kingship. When he announced his renunciation, he asked his followers to inform the king. That implies that perhaps he had already resigned the crown to his blind older brother when he had retired to the forest. Perhaps he only renounced the crown at this moment. It is not clear to me which. What matters is that, even though Dhritarashtra was disqualified in the line of kingship, he was still the next in line for the throne. So when Pandu was no longer king, the crown automatically went to his older brother. Pandu's two wives, ever loyal, joined him in his austerities, begging food and wandering. Pandu embraced his new identity as an ascetic to such a degree that he became something like an honorary Brahmin, living and traveling among all the other ascetics of the forest. Over time, as he considered his situation, he gradually became desperate about his inability to have children. He cited the law in the Vedas, saying that to fail to have children who will perform offerings to their ancestors is essentially to murder one's ancestors. He nearly became suicidal over this conundrum until a fellow holy man told him that despite his curse, he would nevertheless have a number of fine sons to follow him. In his desperation, Pandu spoke to his wife Kunti, suggesting that she look for a superior man of the Brahmin caste to make her pregnant. Kunti replied with the story of another king who was impotent and who had died. 
His wife refused to let go of his corpse and mourned his loss and her childlessness for several weeks. Finally, the spirit of her dead husband came back and through some kind of necrophilia, she was able to conceive. Pandu probably didn't like the implications of this story, so he stuck to his request. At this point, Kunti made a confession. As a young lady living in her adopted father's palace, she had once been host to a powerful sage who, in gratitude, granted her the boon that she could summon any god and conceive a child with him. When Pandu heard this, he was delighted and set her to work right away, saying she should summon the god Dharma and have a child by him. So Kunti recited the spell, and the god Dharma came to her in a yogic form, and she conceived a son. A disembodied voice announced that the child would be a great upholder of Dharma, a celebrated king named Yudhishthira. You might wonder what Dharma was doing still a god when he had already incarnated as the person of Vidor. See episode 6. Well, that's why they call it a partial incarnation. The gods only send down a part of themselves to incarnate as a human. There was still plenty of him left to be both father and partial incarnation of Yudhishthira. Following Yudhishthira's birth, Pandu urged Kunti to use the spell again. This time, he asked for a strong child, so Kunti summoned the wind god. This child was to be named Bhima, and he would be immensely strong. At this point, we should go back to Gandhari, Dhritarashtra's wife, who, remember, was also pregnant. She had actually conceived and become pregnant before Kunti used her spell to conceive Yudhishthira. So Gandhari had every reason to think that her son would be the oldest son of the oldest son. In other words, her child should be the first pick for the heir to the Kuru throne. Imagine her frustration when her pregnancy went on over a year and Yudhishthira was born before her child. Her frustration grew even more when she found that Kunti was pregnant with another child. After two years of pregnancy, she finally snapped and beat her own belly, causing a miscarriage. What came out was a disgusting ball of flesh. Repulsed, Gandhari made the throw it out. Vyasa sensed this and quickly appeared before her. He castigated her, asking her, What are you doing? She answered truthfully, saying, when I heard that Kunti had borne her first son, I became so miserable that I aborted my belly. You promised me a hundred sons, and all I got was this mess of flesh. Vyasa replied, I have never spoken a lie, and so when I said you will have a hundred sons, you can be sure you will. Have at once one hundred pots set up and filled with ghee, and sprinkle this ball with cold water. As soon as the water came in contact with the flesh, it shattered into 101 pieces, each the size of a thumb joint, and each piece was placed in its own jar. After some time, the pots were broken open one at a time. The first to come out of the pot was named Duryodhana, who was born on the very same day as Pandu's second son, Bhima. This made for a murky situation regarding who was a senior child. Duryodhana had been conceived first, but was born after Yudhishthira. Duryodhana was the eldest son of the eldest son, but Yudhishthira was the son of the senior king. It is precisely around these questions that all the future conflicts were born. Dhritarashtra, probably feeling a bit cheated, summoned Bhishma, Vidur, and his advisors, and declared, Prince Yudhishthira is the eldest son in our line. By his own virtue he shall obtain the kingdom, and we shall not demur. But shall Duryodhana then become king after him? When Dhritarashtra finished speaking, there was a sudden outcry from all directions of carrion beasts and jackals. Taking this as a bad sign, Vidur said, Clearly, from these omens, this eldest son of yours will spell the death of the dynasty. You should abandon him at once. You will still have ninety-nine sons, and by sacrificing this one, you will save the world and your dynasty. Vidur ended his speech with an adage, To save a family, one can sacrifice a son. To save a village, one can sacrifice a family. To save the country, give up a village. To save a soul, give up the earth. Vidor and all the advisors were in agreement with this, but the blind king did not act because he loved his sons. In addition to the oldest son, Duryodhana, Dhritarashtra had 99 more sons and one daughter from these jars. I'll spare you all of their names because all but a couple play no distinct part in the story. The main sons would be the oldest two, Duryodhana and Dushasan, and one more named Yuyutsu, who was born of a servant girl. Now, back to Pandu, who, as we recall, had his second son, Bhima, born on the same day as Dhritarashtra's first son, Duryodhana. 
Following Bhima's birth, Pandu asked Kunti to try one more time. This time, he aimed high, deciding to summon the first among the gods, Indra himself. To ensure Indra's cooperation, both he and Kunti spent an entire year in extreme austerity, standing on one foot and facing the sun daily, and barely eating any food at all. Having pleased the Lord Indra, Kunti finally summoned him, and thus was conceived the great hero Arjun. After this great success, Pandu got a little greedy. He started thinking of which god he might call up next, but Kunti stopped him, saying he should be content with these three mighty sons. To ask for more would be improper. At this point, Madri spoke up, saying she would also like to be a mother. Kunti agreed and gave her co-wife the spell so she could also bear a son. Madri, for efficiency's sake, thought to summon the Ashvins, who were twin gods. Thus, she conceived a pair of twins, who would be named Nakula and Sahadeva. Pandu thought to try one more time to round off the bunch, but when he went to Kunti, asking her to allow Madri another turn, Kunti objected. She said, Madri tricked me by conceiving twins. If I let her do this again, she might have another pair of twins and therefore have more sons than me. Thus, the five young sons of Pandu, whom we'll call the Pandavas, were raised in the forest with the hermits and ascetics and nature spirits, while the 100 sons of Dhritarashtra, who will be called the Karavas, were brought up in the palaces of Hastinapur. Thinking back on the Partial Incarnations essay, in which we identified Vidur as an incarnation of Dharma, the case of the Pandavas is more curious. Almost all of the other characters in the Mahabharata are born of human mothers and fathers, but then are sometimes associated with deities as a partial incarnation. The Pandavas are unique in that they are actually conceived by a god on their father's side and have a human for a mother. This idea is very similar to the Greek conception of heroes. Hercules, Achilles, Perseus, and most famously Jesus are just a few examples. So the five Pandavas are both the children of these gods and also their partial incarnations on this earth. These concepts are a little bit murky, however, because later Arjun is paired with Krishna as the reincarnation of the Rishis Nar and Narayan. So I'm not sure how this is all worked out or whether it is completely consistent. While the five Pandavas were still quite young, Pandu was out with his second wife Madri in the forest. This time he wasn't hunting and his lust overcame him. He forgot all about his curse and made love to his wife, dying in her arms. When Kunti found out what happened, she scolded Madri for allowing her husband to get aroused. She then declared that as the first wife, she would follow Pandu on the funeral pyre. Madri protested, saying that she would not be a fair mother for all five sons, and that she could not live without Pandu. Thus, as Pandu's corpse was burning on the funeral pyre, Madri threw herself on it, immolating herself out of loyalty and attachment to her husband. Following the death of Pandu, an enormous crowd of hermits and ascetics gathered in mourning and escorted the widow and orphans back to the city of Hastinapur, where they could be cared for by their next of kin, King Dhritarashtra. That's it for now. Our five heroes are now orphans, living under the roof of their blind uncle with their ill-fated cousins. In the next episode, we'll hear of their upbringing and education, and see how they deal with their jealous cousin, Duryodhana. Thanks for listening. <laughs>